to tonight's Newsmaker Now, where we go one on one with the people making headlines on the issues we're all talking about. And tonight, that's the 2024 candidate that not a lot of people have heard of back in February when he launched his campaign. It's somebody who's now seen as one of the rising stars in the field, at least for the moment. I'm talking about this guy right here, Vivek Ramaswamy. He's 37, he's a multi millionaire. Former hedge fund manager, biotech entrepreneur. As of right now, he's got third place in the 538 average of Republican polling, right? Leading a bunch of current and former governors and members of Congress, but all of them, all of them, well behind former President Donald Trump, who remains the field's clear front runner at the moment. Ramaswamy has framed some of his campaign around so called anti woke politics. This is something we've seen from a number of candidates, including, of course, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Voters are seeming to respond to it. They're talking to our teams on the ground in some of those key early states. Listen to this. I think that Vivek is a really good shot. Um, he is an underdog, but he is highly intelligent. I like listening to him speak. I like his form and track of, of what he would like to do policy-wise. He's brilliant. He's young. He's got great ideas. Uh, and uh, he's an, an excellent advocate for uh, conservatism. Vivek Ramaswamy is joining us now. Mr. Ramaswamy, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Sure. So you just heard it there. A bunch of voters complimenting you. You are obviously surging in polls. They seem intrigued by your message. You could call it a little bit of Vivek Mentum, but I'm old enough to have covered Carly Fiorina yeah. Mentum and Ben Carson Mentum. We could go on and on with examples. Explain why voters should believe you could actually go all the way, that you're having more than just a moment here. Oh, I think this is just the beginning of our climb. One of the metrics we actually look at is we have not spent any money, really, seriously, on TV or radio advertising where the other candidates and their super PACs are pouring money onto ads. And so our surge in polling comes against the backdrop of actually very little spending, which is a great sign for us. That's the track that Trump pursued in 2015. That's the trajectory, if not better, that I'm on right now. And I think it's because voters across this country are responding to my message of addressing our national identity crisis. It's not quite accurate to say I'm running an anti-woke campaign. What I say is that wokeness is just one of many symptoms of a deeper void, a loss of purpose and meaning and identity in our country. And I think that gets to the heart of why young people in particular are so hungry for a cause they will turn to the left-wing narrative of race, gender, sexuality, and climate. What I'm offering in this race is an alternative vision grounded on the individual, family, nation, okay. God. That's something that our base, I think, has been long hungry for, and it's part of what they're responding to. So a couple of things to pull on there. You talk about how you think young people are hungry to find essentially somebody like you here. Um, and yet you ha are out with a platform and you've reiterated it again tonight that would essentially disenfranchise younger voters between the ages of 18 and 24 from actually voting unless they do certain things, pass certain tests, essentially, litmus tests, serve for a certain period of time, et cetera. Why do that? Are you concerned that you are going to turn off those younger voters that you are hoping to appeal to? To the contrary, young people are hungry for purpose and meaning today. So there's no disenfranchising going on. But what I've said is that every high school student who graduates should have to pass the same civics test that an immigrant has to pass in order to become a citizen of this country, to know something about this country and its history and our Constitution. And if not that, then at least serve this country in some way. We have to revive civic duty and civic pride okay. in this country. That's what our founding fathers envisioned. That's a big part of what we've lost. And so I think actually what we're going to see is voting rates will skyrocket amongst young people after we actually make them pass that civics test. But why should a high school graduate have to pass that test and not, let's say, a 60 year old? Well, look, I think that everybody should, but I believe not in taking something away from somebody who already has it, but somebody who's starting with a clean slate in the next generation, ages into citizenship. That should absolutely be the norm. Okay. Frankly, my you mother want passed that same said, citizenship test. Countless Got immigrants it. do. You, you would want everybody, if yeah. you could, everybody to pass a civics test. Is that something yes. you would endorse? That is, but we have to start with a clean slate as people age into actually becoming adults. That's where we're actually going to start driving that change forward. That's the way I look at it. Let me ask you about some of the um, intricacies, perhaps, of the way that you are 
working around the current front runner in this Republican front primary, and that is, of course, former President Donald Trump. You've said a lot of nice things about him. You've called him your friend. You say you respect him. You respect the job that he did. But you've also condemned him, right? You condemned him the week of um, January 6th, the week after, pretty clearly in this tweet. You told Tucker Carlson recently, though, that the Capitol riots were a result of pervasive censorship. So let me just, like, I, I, and I've heard your response to that piece of it. Let me just ask you clearly, do you believe that the election fraud lies pushed by Donald Trump, that his actions are around January 6th in 2020 disqualifies him to be president again? I think that's a question for the voters. I believe that in this country, we the people decide who's actually going to lead us forward. And the way that I want to win this election is not by having the federal administrative police state eliminate my competition. Now that I am in third in the GOP primary field, believe me, it would be a lot easier for me if Donald Trump were not in this race. But I don't stand for politics or self-interest. I stand for principle. And I believe the way I should win this election, the way I will win this election, is by convincing the voters that I'm the best person to lead this country forward. And make no mistake, I would have made many different judgments than Donald Trump did. I think most of his policies were excellent. He achieved a lot in this country. But the way he handled January 6th, there are other matters, I would have handled them very differently, even the way I would have handled the documents. But a bad judgment is not a crime. And when we conflate the two, that sets a dangerous precedent in this country where the party in power will use police force to arrest its political opponents. That's not how we do it in the United States of America. That's why I've taken the position that I have. So does that, in your words, bad judgment by Donald Trump disqualify him to be president in your view? I don't think that there's a litmus test that should legally disqualify him from being president. I'm asking no, about your opinion. But I do believe that I'm making the case. Well, my opinion is I'm going to be the best president to lead this nation forward. And yes, I'm running in the same race that he's running because I still believe I will be the best candidate to revive our missing national identity, to unite our country, to grow our economy, to shut down the administrative state, declare independence from China. These are the things I care about, okay. and I am in this race because I'm convinced I am the best person who can deliver on that, and that's what I exactly expect to do. I can't help but note that you did not answer the question, Mr. Ramaswamy. Is there a reason for that? I, I, I did answer your question. He should not I be legally him. disqualified from running. Answered your question. Okay, and you believe that in your view, I'm not even asking about the legal piece of it, though. You would vote for him, you're saying? No, I'm going to vote for myself in this election. That is why I'm running in this election to be our next president. Point, I do. I did taken. vote for him in the last election. Yeah, I, I hear yeah. you on that. Let so, me ask so, you about a couple of other things it, because I, I, I want to get there. to some. I want to get to some policy pieces for you here because um, you have sure. talked about. Um, sort of this idea of ESG investments, for example, and you, you've been you've been clear about that piece of it. And yet, their recent federal financial disclosure form showed that you have invested in companies that support those kinds of ESG policies. In other words, companies that take sort of environmental and social issues into account. I get that you have an outside advisor making these investment calls, but it is your money and it is getting spent on something that you say you don't believe in. How do you square that? Well, actually, if you read my books and understand the criticism I've leveled against ESG, it goes one step deeper. The real problem isn't somebody owning stock in Disney or Nike or any other company. It's the fact that their money is being used to vote for policies in those boardrooms that do not advance those shareholders' best interests. That's really where the ESG problem is biggest, is in shareholder voting, voting for environmental agendas, racial equity audits, climate emissions caps. That's what I've been an opponent of. It's also why I went the further distance of founding Strive. The company I last founded was actually the competitor to BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, offering alternatives to this ESG orthodoxy, voting in corporate America's boardrooms, telling them to go back to focusing on profits and products, not politics and social agendas. And that's how I'm wired. I've written two books on this subject, but I'm not just an academic. I believe in acting on my convictions. That's why I started a business leading business in this area, but even more importantly, why I'm delivering that message now as a presidential candidate. And that's, I think, the kind of leadership we need, people who don't just pontificate about problems, but people who actually step up to solve them. And that's what well, I've done. Let's talk about stepping up here. There's a moment that got some cable news attention, I think a couple of weeks ago, that was played, uh, I believe, obtained and played over on CNN, a moment from one of your campaign events. I want to play that. You have to actually make sure the Federal Reserve is politically accountable. 
See, this idea that it's supposed to be some sort of s special entity that exists outside the checks and balances of the government, that's where the original sin begins. Right? And you're correct to point out what very few people are aware of. Absolutely, that happens. So the voter question in there, Mr. Ramaswamy, was cut off, but this was a question from a voter from somebody at one of your events asking about the Fed um, in what appears to be a conspiracy theory, putting zeros into the bank accounts of some of your political competitors. And that's you saying that this person is correct to point that out. It's one thing to suggest or to make the argument that the Fed needs more that accountability, but it's that was the question. We have the transcript here. The question was about whether or not the Fed is adding zeros to bank accounts from media companies and, and to your political opponents. Why did you say that person is correct? I, I didn't. I find it kind of laughable that you cut it that way. But what I have said is that the, uh, the response that I stand by is that the Federal Reserve has been responsible for many of the economic headwinds that we've seen in this country. And I will dramatically reform the U.S. Fed by bringing an over 90 percent headcount reduction to the U.S. Federal Reserve. But with due respect, I'm going to tell you, you're doing your viewers and doing media is doing a disservice if you're selectively cutting videos and then putting words into somebody else's mouth that wasn't in that video. When, in fact, what we should be doing that is, is having full, an actual that is your full response, Mr. Ramaswamy. Merits I of Federal Reserve policy. But that's what we're trying to do here. And it my, didn't my sound like that's what you were doing reform, in response. And that's what we need. Let me play. Oh, absolutely, a what I'm doing in response is I'm I'm stating a policy that you disagree with, which is the Fed. I don't. I don't have an, I'm, not, I'm not trying to have a, a debate with you about the opinion on the policy of the Fed. I'm simply asking you about your response to somebody who seemed to propose this conspiracy theory. Because do you agree that people running for presidency should be operating in the realm of fact? It's a pretty basic question. Of course they should, as I am. I'm tied to fact at every step. Frankly, I don't even recognize or understand what the alleged conspiracy that you're citing even is. That's the first time I'm hearing about some nonsensical theory that's actually putting words in somebody else's mouth who had legitimate concerns about the Fed and the financial system using central bank digital currencies through the Fed Now program that they're advancing that would give the government centralized authority to potentially wipe out bank accounts just like you see in China, just like Canada did to those truckers who were protesting in Canada. That's something that we do not want to see here in the United States. That's exactly what central bank digital currencies are about. That's what the Fed Now program is about. You have a Democratic candidate in this race in the form of RFK who's pointed out why that's wrong. I'm a Republican candidate pointing out the same thing, that the Fed needs to go back to one job, stabilize the U.S. dollar as a unit of measurement. Have their policies embracing inflation and unemployment as a balancing act been a disaster? Absolutely. And no, that's not a conspiracy theory. That is reality that has hurt many Americans. And we ought to have that debate in the open without distorting you. some people's questions, I... cutting them off on air when, in fact, we get to the truth of the matter. Nothing was cut off. And I appreciate you bringing this back to the merits of the issue at hand, which is about the Fed, as you did. Before I let you go, I do have to ask you one more question, because we talked to voters. We played it in the introduction sure. here who say that they support you. We also talked to voters and we're running out of time. So I'm, I'm going to summarize it for you. Who suggest that they would like to see you as a potential pick for Don for vice president. I realize that you are running for the presidency. I know that this is an annoying question. I've had to ask it of other candidates because there is conversation happening for voters around this. If that is something that comes up, Mr. Ramaswamy, would you at least consider it? I would not because I don't do well in a number two position. I do my best when I'm leading the way. And one of my commitments in this race is we're running to lead a nation like Reagan did in 1980. That's what I'm running to do in 2024. And even an interview like this one, you know, even though we have differences of opinion, this is important. There are other candidates in this field that have said they literally won't talk to NBC News because they feel like the interviews are unfair. To the contrary, I think we need more healthy debate like we've just had here. That's what it's going to take to revive the soul of this nation. And I think I can't do that from a number two position. I'm doing this to do as Reagan did in 1980. That was the Reagan revolution. We'll bring you the Ramaswamy revolution in 2024. You won't catch me disagreeing about the need for more candidates to come on, uh, talk to yeah. folks. I appreciate your time. I appreciate this conversation. Vivek Ramaswamy, Mr. Ramaswamy, thank you very much for joining us and for uh, taking the time for us. And I appreciate it.